and Dr. And Dr. Jacob is going to be helping facilitate the uh, Q&A at the end of the meeting. So tonight, as you all know, we're privileged to be hearing from one of the most respected and authoritative voices in integrative medicine today. Dr. Paul Anderson is a renowned naturopathic oncologist and IM practitioner with more than 30 years of clinical experience in integrative oncology. And this evening, we're gonna be the beneficiaries of this long experience as Dr. Anderson reflects on the factors of care that he has identified as common denominators among cancer patients with superior outcomes. And he has come to these conclusions after extensive retrospective data analysis, not just impressionistically. Um, besides his work as a clinician, whose specialties also extend to complex infectious and chronic illness, he is widely recognized as an educator, researcher, and author. Um, just to name a couple of things, Dr. Anderson has headed oncology research for the National Institutes of Health, of Health <clears throat> taught pharmacology and clinical medicine at Bastyr University and um, uh, numerous other institutions, and co-authored Outside the Box Cancer Therapies, among other books. And he is also the founder and organizer of the highly regarded semi-annual Advanced Applications in Medical Practice Symposia in Scottsdale, Arizona, which does feature an integrative oncology theme about every two years. Um, there's a lot more that I could add here, but um, you can easily look up additional details of his bio on the internet. And I think our time would best be spent by reserving as much of it as possible for Dr. Anderson's address. Uh, we will, as always, leave the last part of the meeting for questions and comments from the virtual audience. And you can put your comments and questions into the chat, please. And um, really, that's it. I was going to say that Amy has put a link in to um, join our mailing list for free, but she already said that, so I don't need to repeat it. <laughs> Dr. Anderson, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I know that uh, we're at probably the end of everybody's work day, so we're going to try and have some fun and keep this moving. And uh, We'll, we will, at the end, have some time for questions as well that uh, Dr. Wolf will help me out with so that I don't have to do too many things at once. Uh, there's nothing financially motivated here as far as products or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so my background was mentioned, and uh, these slides are not here to be the sort of, ooh, look at me. But I think if I'm going to tell you what I've noticed retrospectively over three decades and conclusions I've come to from that, it might be good if you know the background from which uh, that comes. And it's, uh, as was mentioned, it's not just sort of made up things, et cetera. Uh, these are two books, as was mentioned, Outside the Box Cancer Therapies with Dr. Stengler. This we wrote for patients and their families, but we also knew that doctors would read it. And we know that the number one question a patient will get is, well, they're from their oncologist usually is that there's no research on whatever it is they're presenting. So this is literally a, a therapeutic uh, outline and overview. And we have about 1,100 peer-reviewed references in it. So it's referenced like a textbook so that they can interface with, uh, with their other healthcare providers. Uh, following that, I realized that while we talked about it in Outside the Box, the mind-body connection part of getting a cancer diagnosis was something I really, that was very much, you know, on my heart because of uh, all of the years of dealing with patients. And this is always, uh, you know, an undercurrent. So Cancer, the Journey from Diagnosis uh, to Empowerment is is the follow-up book that is complete. It's agnostic of how you treat your cancer. And it's all about what goes on on the inside and how to become an empowered patient, regardless of your diagnosis. Um, our book that Mark and I wrote, it's been translated into a number of languages. It's around the world now. Uh, I've also written a lot of other clinical guidelines, et cetera. In my spare time, which I've never been paid for, uh, I do government advocacy uh, with both Congress, but usually with the FDA. 
And most of you know that the FDA is not really a fan of integrative medicine, nor the tools that we use. So a lot of the advocacy is around interfacing with FDA and compounding pharmacy and that sort of thing. Now, one of the things that triggered me to start to look backwards over time at essentially what, what did my patients who had better outcomes have in common? And that could have been better quality of life, maybe extension of life, maybe remissions, et cetera. And a lot of that was certainly happening my whole career. But in, uh, as was mentioned, I was a full-time faculty at Bastyr University for five years. And during those five years, we had a National Institute of Health funded human research trial that uh, was looking at cancer outcomes in uh, patients who did integrative oncology versus just doing standard of care. And the nice thing was that we, they were also, the integrative oncology group got whatever standard of care they needed. So it wasn't an either or. These are two publications that kind of came out of that. Uh, Dr. Standish was our co-PI. Uh, so one that's sort of her 30 year anniversary looking back in that paper. And then what I want to say is that the one publication that kind of came directly from that research that we did down below there uh, with Dr. Standish and Sweet et al. about breast cancer outcomes, it, it's a very good paper, but it leaves out about 80% of what we did. So about 80% of all of the work that we did, and if you read the especially the second paper, none of the work that I did is in there, none of the work that some of the other collaborators did. And it's just because of the way you have to write papers and keep them focused on certain things. So certainly a lot of, it was a very rich time to look at integrative oncology, look at different tools we could use, but also think about what is it about a whole practice model of integrative oncology that might make somebody have a better outcome. <clears throat> now from the NIH funded research, we um, which we called the BIORC, which is Bastyr Integrative Oncology Research Center. Uh, we came up with this publication and I came up with a number of other things. And then on the heels of that, because we had a lot of good extension of life and quality of life doing uh, age match SEER data between our group and the other groups, we started this, the QCO study, Canadian U.S. Integrative Oncology Study, which was funded uh, outside of the NIH through a Canadian funding agency. And I was involved in the beginning of this, and it had seven centers. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, it is it is ongoing. Uh, the data is now being assessed from this particular trial. So that was another one. Some of the things that came out of this work, though, were the infamous and very long intravenous ascorbate and oncology agents. This is a tool that uh, I researched and wrote for our oncologist colleagues so that they could see what data there was on intravenous vitamin C and different chemotherapy and radiation protocols. And the, the, the punchline is most of them are very synergistic in the data as opposed to what everyone thought. And then the list on the right-hand side, these are all free on the website, uh, are different uh, white papers and protocol bases and other things that kind of came out of the research. Some came later, and, and they're all there as well. So there's a lot of work that came out of this uh, mini-year uh, oncology experience. And I just want to say what we're going to talk about here, which is really my... Uh, to the date, to date summative sort of uh, ideas about what's the base of integrative oncology. These are things that play out in real time in oncology, and any of us who work in oncology will notice these. <clears throat> they are really literally looking back over decades worth of lots and lots of patients, and my experience with directly with patients, but also supervising uh, as an attending in hospitals and other uh, locations lots and lots of integrative oncology patients. And they're certainly not meant to be encyclopedic or meant to be everything you could ever think of. These are just, if I really boiled it down to the base, what are you know two of the major things that I learned? And here's the other thing. If you've ever worked with even one integrative oncology patient, but certainly if you've worked with more than that, nothing I'm gonna say to you will be a, probably a revelation 
other than it might just be the way it, it, it sort of uh, got packaged together when I was looking backwards over all of our data. So the first thing, so there's kind of two buckets of information. The first thing is really around context and oncology. And context in this setting comes from where is the patient at in this potential spectrum of the oncology experience for the patient with their cancer diagnosis and their cancer treatment? And a lot of this context idea, which breaks down into four areas, is mostly there to help us communicate with the patient, but also sometimes communicate with ourselves. Given where the patient is at right now, what are our primary objectives and where should we put our time and resources as far as treatment? Because you can always do almost any treatment at any time, but sometimes there are uh, more critical things to worry about in a treatment area when a patient is in a particular phase of their cancer journey versus in another phase. And sometimes we have more restrictive uh, timing that we have to do, or maybe they're just more physically fragile. And other times we have less restrictive timing. We have more options and maybe the patient has more physical vitality to deal with. So that's where this kind of comes from. But in doing that, I boiled down the idea that if I'm going to assess a patient as far as what I want to do with them, I need to look at what phase of the cancer journey are they in. And that divided into four fairly clear phases. So this graphic uh, on the left, we reads left to right, uh, primary prevention. Now that's where you don't know you have cancer yet. So it's not maybe, it's in the cancer journey, certainly <clears throat> it's not as much maybe what we would talk about here. But if you look at the left side and the right side, which is secondary prevention, which is I know I had cancer and I would like it not to come back or I'd like to keep a durable remission, et cetera, the principles of primary and secondary prevention are very similar. The intensity at which you may go after those principles might be different. After prevention, though, we usually have a diagnostic event and then you usually there's active therapy. Now, of course, there's options here. You could have a diagnostic event and the oncology team may say, we're sorry, there's no treatment uh, for what you have, or you're not healthy enough for treatment, or you're too old for the treatment we have, or some other thing. But diagnosis and active therapy is certainly a unique time, and it's an intense time for people. And then after that, we have recovery from active therapy, which makes sense. We at some point get over major therapy. Maybe we go into uh, some sort of maintenance protocols, or maybe we do other things, or maybe we're just done and we're on, we're on uh, watchful waiting. Now, the two blue arrows that go to the left and the right from diagnosis and recovery are just there to illustrate the idea that we all know, which is not everybody lives through every stage. We have people who die after diagnosis or during active therapy, we have people who die in recovery, uh, and, and we have people certainly die at other uh, junctures. So this is just to be a little realistic and say not every patient is going to experience this whole flow. But what we see in modern times is we have more people going through all of the phases. And so this then leads us to some logic that we can apply as to what kind of treatment would I like to focus on in these different areas? So these are just sort of breaking, these slides are breaking down these four areas and I'm, you know, would not do at this point in the evening to read to you, you'd probably fall asleep, but we can just go through these kind of quickly. They're here for reference later on, if you want to think about that. Um, but I think that this particular, in the bold uh, writing here, this idea is one of the reasons I do this and I and I try and share this with students and residents, et cetera, is that if we look at the phase where the patient's at and what they're doing, it helps us apportion the therapies and the resources appropriately, or at least hopefully more appropriately than we might otherwise do. And so if I only have, you know, uh, let's say I'm doing interventional things with you, maybe IV therapy or hyperbaric or something like that. 
and I only have one or two days a week, then I need to focus those therapies on what's going to be the best for whatever phase of the cancer journey you're in. And that also helps you, uh, the patient, in your use of your resources. Now, there are exceptions, uh, very aggressive disease where you may only have one chance. You have a very aggressive, um, you know, stage four pancreatic cancer patient or something, and you don't really have time to pull back on what you're doing. Certainly exceptions exist, but in general, these things will play out kind of the way we're going to talk okay. about them. The other thing is, is patient patient education, which is helping patients when they're asking, well, why don't you also do this treatment? Why don't you also include these things? And sometimes the answer to that is a simple, well, that treatment wouldn't be appropriate for what you have going on, or it uh, doesn't really show a lot of evidence that it's going to work in your type of cancer, for example. But sometimes it is, uh, we do that treatment, but generally we want to focus all of our efforts now on these other treatments that meet where your body and your, your treatment are at. And then we can do this treatment you're asking about when you're maybe in recovery or in prevention, et cetera. So it helps them contextualize it. So just very quickly, primary prevention, like I said, sure, you know, everybody has cancer cells arise. We all don't want cancer. And everybody who has cancer diagnosed at some point will have the experience of having the opportunity for primary prevention, which we're all hopefully trying to do. So it's at the beginning before anything helps. But a lot of prevention of cancer is working through whatever the best medicine for your individual body is. And so, for example, we look at dietary interventions and metabolic flexibility and metabolic cancer types of inter interventions. Some people's bodies have genetically an easier time being more metabolically flexible, and some people have much harder time. And so if we're in a primary preventive setting, uh, being attentive to the diet, uh, both through the micronutrients and the mixture of micronutrients and then the macronutrients and how they affect our metabolic flexibility can be a, a cancer prevention strategy as well as a treatment strategy. Uh, the repletion of nutrients, the removal or avoidance of toxicants, all of the things that are determinants of health come into play, of course, in primary prevention. And if we look at it in sort of modern terms, it's trying to keep the epigenome calm and in some kind of homeostatic state, because we know that there are hard, uh, hardcore genetic predeterminants of cancer, such as BRCA, et cetera. But we also know that those are only turned on in 50, 55, 60% of people, which means there's 40% of people that epigenetically don't turn them on. And there has to be reasons that even those hardcore uh, cancer genetics don't get turned on or do get turned on. Now, there's uh, uh, thousands of other genetic codes that we can pick up that may make us more or less uh, a target for an oncologic process. And it's the same thing. The more we can keep our epigenome handled and balanced and not pushing on the genes that we might have that are uh, possibly going to turn on epigenetically and lead us to disease, the longer we will have without cancer getting a foothold in the body. And that's basically anything that stresses us. It can be mental emotional stress. It can be not sleeping enough. It can be not exercising enough. It can be poor diet. It can be toxic exposure, chronic infections, all manner of other things. So, Ideas in primary prevention are, are basically just looking at a very good history with an eye towards what can I do to make you the healthiest person possible and the smallest target for cancer. Initial diagnosis and therapy is where people usually come to us once they have the label of being a cancer patient, obviously. And so this is uh, primary prevention is not available anymore because now we have a diagnosis. And so here we have other ID 
ideas and other thoughts. But one of the biggest issues in this part, diagnosis or active therapy, is that the patient is now not only dealing with a disease process, but they are dealing emotionally with a uh, disease process that they never wanted to hear that they had as a human. And there's a million reasons why that can be very overwhelming, most of which are fairly obvious. The other thing is one of the inciting reasons for people to go and be checked and often be diagnosed with cancer is usually they aren't feeling well. And now they really don't feel well. And so not only are they going to probably be set up for a bunch of therapies that may not make them feel well, but they started out the whole problem not feeling well. And now they have the mental emotional pall over them of a cancer diagnosis. Now, there are exceptions. Some people have felt relatively fine and just incidentally had stage four cancer picked up. I've had many patients like that. And often they say, no, I really, I, I honestly didn't feel any different. Uh, you know, maybe if I look back five or 10 years, I felt different, but I really didn't. And the person would be, you know, gone in four or five weeks. Um, so those, those things do happen. But generally speaking, you have a person who has a physical and mental burden, and now they have a whole other part of the medical machine involved in their life, meaning diagnosis, treatment, maybe surgery, maybe radiation, chemo, whatever. And these are things that they were never a part of before. So it's very confusing. It's overwhelming. It's a lot going on. Okay. So when we think of it from the patient's point of view that way, diagnosis and active treatment, we may only have little windows into their life and their time to deal with them during that. Now, is it important that we do? Certainly. Um, but if we only have small windows and wedges of their time, we want to maximize what we are doing for that patient so that they have the best chance of, if there is standard therapy working, it works. If there is standard therapy with a lot of side, side effects, we minimize the side effects. And also that we can then start them on the road so that their recovery has a head start. One of the problems, and we wrote about this in Outside the Box Cancer Therapies, we were the first book that I could find anywhere to include this data in, in an actual text about oncology, and that is, which is more commonly known now, that radiation and chemotherapy, while very good at reducing the size of the initial tumors, engender stronger, stronger cancer stem cells and stronger a tumor microenvironment. So radiation chemotherapy are directly tied to reoccurrence of cancer. And in every paper that you read about this, every paper ends the same way. And it says, we know this to be true. We do not want to frighten patients because of this, because there are benefits to chemotherapy and radiation in some people. And the third, which is probably the least um, uplifting part, if you know anything about uh, pharmacology and tumor biology, they end with the statement, our hope is that we will find targeted cancer therapies that will stop this effect of chemotherapy and radiation, creating stronger cancer down the road. Um, it, certainly in my lifetime, that is not going to be invented. Uh, the reasons for engendering stronger tumor stem cells, uh, it would take a lot more than one targeted therapy to do that. So our goal through diagnosis active therapy, and certainly when we get to the next phase of, uh, of recovery, is to also deal with this effect if our patient has had standard chemotherapy, radiation, et cetera. So you have to ask, what can your patient do? How much time do they have? How much energy do they have? Or do they start kind of vital and you got more to work with? Do they start very sick, don't have a lot to work with? Do they have a lot of comorbidities uh, that you're fighting with, you know, uncontrolled diabetics, et cetera? Is what you're doing all coming out of pocket or mostly coming out of pocket? And so they, you know, have financial constraints, a really good thing to find out early on. 
how are they tolerating their standard therapies? Do we have to really focus a lot of time on tolerance and helping with side effects, you know, mucositis and all of the other things that happen? And then what are the perceived interactions between what we're going to do and radiation and chemotherapy? And I, I'm not going to go into a long discussion in the yellow uh, highlight there. It says, let's discuss. The bottom line is, is that with very few exceptions, most integrative therapies done during active cancer treatment are very sick. And unless you're doing something really novel or something no one's ever looked at before, most of the things that we would do to deal with side effects, for example, many of them are very well studied and very safe. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, one of the reasons that I wrote that review paper on vitamin C and chemotherapy was the uh, you know the ongoing thought even to this day is that vitamin C will just shut down chemotherapy and make it you know non-useful. And if you, I mean even if you think about the way that most standard chemotherapy works, that's sort of laughable that vitamin C would be that strong. But what most of the data shows is that there's actually synergy. As a matter of fact, in most of the most common used uh, chemotherapeutics there's only data on synergy there's no there's no energy there's no uh you know issues of contribution etc other therapies such as heat therapies hyperthermia and other heat therapies most photodynamic therapies uh hyperbaric oxygen number of other things same thing so in the Active diagnosis and treatment, you got a side effect management is kind of paramount. We're looking at, you know, quality of life control. We're looking at synergizing other therapies. So there might be natural things that we could use that would be uh, radiosensitizing or chemosensitizing. Those might be good things to include. And then we might do anti-cancer type therapies that are natural alongside the other things or in place of if the per we've had many patients where they're told you're you're too old for me, the medical oncologist, to give you chemo. Uh, so maybe you can find some other way to, to work with this. So then the, you have a much more open uh, palette to work with. And I just put these in because these come from Osher Cancer Center at University of California, San Francisco. And um, I put it in just a lot of times we'll use these to show a patient that the a very large standard allopathic medical center is also giving their patients very similar to advice to what we're giving you as far as your uh, treatment and caring for yourself during active therapy. So they go through here, they're, they're looking at, you know, fasting around chemotherapy, which we've all heard about and know about. And if you look here, the blue bars, it's a little fuzzy, but this is from Osher. The, the blue bars uh, are all lower, and these are symptoms. The red bars are ad lib, you know, no restriction on the diet. The blue bars are doing a little bit of fasting around your chemo, much better uh, quality of life, lower symptoms, et cetera. And then this, when it says from our literature, this is from Osher Cancer Center at UCSF, and it's talking about things that, again, these would be bare minimums for what most of us would recommend. But I like to share them with patients because, you know, they'll often think maybe they're talking to someone like us, you know, that is, we're really a, we're really opposed uh, to everything that they're doing at the cancer center at the U. And in, in many cases, we're not. So recovery from active therapy, this is a really important time. Now, another factor to think of is, Sometimes we only get people when they're done with chemo and radiation and they say, hey, go and get healthy somehow, right? That's fine. That's this phase. But what I found is if we can work with the people with their diet and potentially interventions for uh, side effects and interventions to strengthen their immune response, et cetera, and synergize with their standard therapies in phase two, you know, diagnosis, reactive treatment, when they get here, this is an easier hill to climb. But a lot of times we get people in this place and that's fine too. So this is after active therapy. Now they might be on a maintenance chemo. Uh, they might be on some other maintenance therapy. They may be having, uh, you know, watchful waiting with monitoring. It's whatever the patient is, uh, you know, standard of care is for them. 
And usually this is a better, you know, time mentally, emotionally for the patient where they're feeling lighter. They're feeling very happy that the active cancer therapy is over. One of the things I remember trying to navigate a lot when I was new in the world of integrative oncology was not putting a damper on this sort of joy that they were over and done with their chemo and everything, but also having a way to explain to the patient that, um, yes, we're done with chemo and radiation or whatever it is you were doing, you're healing from your surgery, but we can't take the foot off the gas as far as healing your body and as far as making you a small target for cancer. Because, and, and it's getting better now, but you know, I certainly remember 20, 25 years ago or more, um, the languaging from, uh, from medical oncology often would be, well, you know, you probably are in remission and, you know, we won't worry about it till we do your next scan or we, you know, whatever it was. And the subtle message or not so subtle message, the patient often was, gosh, I'm done. I can go back to living my life like I was before. And what the patient often doesn't understand is that this is a golden time to not only help them physically recover, which is huge, but also this is a golden time to try and calm down the tumor microenvironment so that the cancer stem cells stay very quiet. Cancer stem cells will never leave, and they are what make us have cancer later. Our job is to make the cancer cells so quiet and happy that they don't want to wake up and make the tumor microenvironment so well balanced that it doesn't turn on its tumor biology and recruit normal cells back into the cancer business. That's really the job here. Now, why is recovery from active therapy a golden time to do this? It's because the body is in a healing mode. It's in a rebound. Let's say they had chemo or radiation. It's in a healing mode from those things. And so everything is sort of in shock. And if we can come in underneath that and establish good baseline dietary uh, interventions, and uh, usually, in, you know, in our case, there will be botanical medicines, which could in, include herbs, could include the mushroom families, could include all sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> and trying to do all that at the same time and using as multi-purpose agents as possible. So if they're really in a healing phase, we may use things from the botanical community or the nutrient community or whatever that are going to both help the body and the healing, but also be very uh, anti-cancer or epigenetically calming. Um, if they're kind of beyond the healing phase, but they're still, they're very fatigued, they have all these, you know, kind of post-chemo malaise, et cetera, brain fogs, et cetera. We're, we're going to work, you know, more with those targets, again, with as many things as we can do that would be targeting uh, keeping the, the immunome as healthy and balanced as possible. So usually here you have more of an open hand. You're more, it's more likely that the radiation or medical oncology are, are not going to care as much what you're doing in this phase. Uh, they care more during active treatment because that's their job um, and they care less during this time. So it's usually you have a freer hand. <clears throat> um, so usually they're at a break from standard of care, as it says in the highlighted area. And while they might be on some maintenance thing or they might be on a longer cycle out, you've just got more time and you can help, you know, restoring mitochondrial function because it gets beat up pretty hard with most standard therapies, helping them heal if they had surgery or, you know, uh, big biopsies, et cetera, and then helping them in a gentle depuration, detoxification, huge in this time. So the big focus here kind of getting them back, uh, obviously healing, focusing on diet, movement, brain. We'll talk about that more coming up. But a lot of times here, they're not quite as sick and they're more desirous of eating, eating more broadly, et cetera. So it's a good time to keep on that. Calming the epigenome, which is basically looking at what would have stirred it up before. Does that mean we not might want to incorporate some detoxification here? Are there chronic infections we need to deal with? Uh, are, are there other things that we need to in the, in the chronic illness space? 
if they are on maintenance anti-cancer therapies that are standard of care, certainly supporting those, uh, but also doing things that would be persistently anti-cancer. That could be mushroom type uh, interventions. A lot of botanicals will do that. It's, it's an endless list there, really. So timing and all of that mattering, uh, I'm, I'm going to go through this rather quickly, um, just because if you know about it, you'll, you'll know way more than the slides I'm going to show you. If it's something that you've heard about, but you kind of haven't wrapped your mind around quite as far as you want to, these slides would be sort of an entree, but it's this whole idea of the, the tumor microenvironment, right? So Again, the long-term effects of standard therapies in many cases are to have more, um, more cancer come later on, okay? Everything we can do between diagnosis, active treatment, recovery, and secondary prevention to keep that body calm, to keep the microenvironment calm, will make the return either not happen or push it out as far as you possibly can. So you'll see cancer stem cells and TM is tumor microenvironment and the slides coming up. Um, that's we've been talking about that. Here's some references. This is right out of right out of the book. Um, so improving the tumor stem cells, tumor microenvironment. Dietary changes. We kind of have a, a graphic we use with our patients. It's a pyramid. And the bottom of it actually is to work towards a 13 hour intermittent fast. So that's basically you stop eating after dinner, you drink, you can drink as much water as you want. And 13 hours later, the next day is when you have your next meal. And most people, you know, unless they're a brittle diabetic or something, you can work them up to this with, you know, a very little coaching. And the reason for this is, is that it's about 12 to 13 hours in the human research is where, uh, we see a change in, in survival in people with known cancer. Now, this also affects people with other diseases too. Then whatever uh, supplements are appropriate kind of, you know, next on top of that, obviously with diet, you, you have things like the cleanliness of your diet. We tell uh, is when we get into people about just remove the junk. Okay, so you 13 hour, intermittent fast, remove all the junk, right? Uh, and then look at, you know, then we look at your macros and all of the cool things that come after that. But it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any sense to have a really cool uh, macro, you know, diet set up that's really going to help you. And 40, 50, 70% of it is full of chemicals that your body doesn't need and probably help you uh, to cause cancer. So there's that. So these are just some different papers talking about tumor microenvironment. One of the concepts, this paper was an early, this is 13 years old now, the earlier paper talking about how the microenvironment actually can, it says fertilize uh, the microenvironment so that the normal cells get recruited over to the dark side and actually can become cancer. This is a big part of cancer reoccurrence that we try to oppose. This is uh, from a little bit later paper, but it's looking at the idea that, well, cancer drugs are gonna beat up the yellow tumor and make it smaller, but the stem cells survive and they actually they actually go into hiding and they're stronger. And then the relapse is basically that the stem cells come out of their hibernation and, uh, and, and are often stronger the second time around. So this is kind of a busy little uh, graphic, but it's uh, it's what it's trying to show is you see the yellow part there, the tumor stroma or the microenvironment, and then the the tumor. The part I'll talk to patients about though for their own mental set is I'm actually more interested in the part of you that doesn't have cancer than the part that has cancer. It's not that I'm not interested in your cancer but the majority of your cells don't have cancer. And the more we can do to make them strong and make them resistant, the more of a leg up we have on actually fighting with your cancer. If the parts of you that are normal are weak, 
and are full of toxic influences, infectious influences, endocrine disruption, endocrine imbalance, all of those things. If you're out of balance in the normal part, it's an easy target for the tumor to continue to grow, to come back, et cetera. So it's sort of a graphic I use for that. This is a little bit newer paper from a year ago. Uh, and this is, a, this is a really wonderful one to look at as far as tumor microenvironment goes. If you're if you're into this is a really good update on that. Um, so in regard to the microenvironment. What we're looking at there is there's obvious things like post-surgical seeding that we have to watch out for. We know that radiation and chemotherapy make the, the stromal stem cells stronger. And so we need to do things to keep everything healing and as uh, homeostatically balanced as possible. So you can read that if you want. These are pretty uh, kind of logical. The things that are important you know, toxicants, including emotional toxicants. There are people that are emotionally toxic in people's lives, and they can sometimes be worse than any other toxicant you might have. Metals, chemicals, chemicals includes mycotoxins from molds and other stuff. Uh, poor oxygenation, poor nutrition, all of the determinants of health. And then mitochondrial deficits. As the mitochondria go, so goes the rest of the human. And while a lot of anti-cancer therapies are very mitochondrially damaging, and so sometimes that's necessary, part of the recovery, either during active therapy or recovery phase, is trying to get the person, uh, get their mitochondria to work again in a normal way. And then secondary prevention, as I said, it's an augmented version of primary prevention because now you know you did have cancer and you're either you know in remission or no evidence of disease, uh, or you're in a very durable long-term remission or, you know, some something. Or we have people who are have a smoldering cancer that's not in remission, but it's also not really trending up, which is a whole other thing that we see more now than we used to. So here, regardless of what label gets put on it for secondary prevention, your goal is to continue that healing and again, to make the body a very poor target for the reoccurrence of cancer. Now, this was named by my clinic doctors. Um, this was another thing that retrospectively I look back because they kept saying, well, what, what is it you do when you run into a case and you don't know where to go next? I said, I know there's something I do, but I've never written it down. And so over the course of a few months, they said, well, why don't, why don't you think about it and write it down? And so uh, when I came and presented it to the clinic staff, they named it uh, after me, apparently. So it's eight areas. And I just look at it. These are rocks to turn over when you're looking at balance in the persons. And they really cover everything. So cell function, that includes your genetics, epigenetics. It includes mitochondrial function, includes your basic micronutrition, includes hydration, includes all those sort of hygienic things. The toxin load, biofilm and resistance factors, which feeds into immunology. So the immunology could be autoimmunity, could be chronic infections, could be a little bit of both. None of that's going to help with homeostasis. Endocrine balance and secondary prevention. Endocrine balance is hugely important. I've never had a secondary prevention patient come in with a normal endocrine system. And while occasionally with hormone responsive cancers, we have to be careful with certain hormones, reestablishing the hormone balance that the person needs as a human of their age and gender, et cetera, is so critical because without the endocrine system running, the endocrine system of someone in secondary prevention without treatment usually is pushed into uh, a milieu that is the same as all of your chronically ill people's uh, endocrine milieu, which is a very pro-inflammatory and actually pro-cancer endocrine milieu. It's very important. Uh, the psychosocial portions can't be understated. And, you know, if that's not what you do, or if it's not something you have time to do, you know, we partner with people who are very specifically in the mental, uh, mental, emotional health world, and they work with cancer patients. So it's a, it's, it's very important. I don't think there's anyone whose digestive system isn't messed up, but certainly people after cancer treatment, it's worse. And then physical and structural things, which could take on any meaning you need. 
but usually <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things on the physical plane that need to be dealt with. So these are just sort of elucidating those eight areas. And so you start treat what you see, and then we'll move on to sort of the next uh, concept that really came up as far as what did my long term surviving high quality of life people all have in common. Uh, and that's really three primary things, which is food, muscle, and brain. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that for a few minutes. But these little, uh, they look like sort of an eclipse happening or something. Uh, the darker shade is the role of integrative oncology and the clear uh, crescents are the role of standard oncology. And I'm certainly never against standard oncology. You know, I think there's no bad medicine. There's bad times to do medicine and there's bad uh, application of medicine. Um, but certainly if somebody needs something, they need it. And uh, I'm happy to work with anything. But if you look at, uh, you know, a 100% representation of primary prevention, standard medical ideas around primary prevention or maybe 10% of, of everything that's available that we might do. Diagnosis and active treatment, they have a little bit bigger crescent of the moon there. And that's because they might need surgery. They may need certain biopsies. They may need certain other types of uh, care or medications or radiation or something. Recovery, there's a little bit of standard medicine in recovery, but most of it's not. And then secondary prevention, there's almost nothing published about secondary prevention in the standard literature. There are, there are things here and there, but that's really not a huge area in standard of care. But in the last couple of minutes here, these foundations, and then we'll do, do some questions. And I, these are, again, not going to be anything you haven't thought about before. But literally, when I look backwards and I thought, okay, so we, we kind of see this approach to dealing with a cancer patient in these four phases of the cancer journey. But if I look back at the people that did really well, regardless, and most of my patients were stage four cancer patients. Um, so I, I rarely got in I'm occasionally a stage three cancer patient, but I rarely got anybody with a low stage grade cancer. What was it about the people that had good quality of life and good length of life and all of that? What was it that was uh, in common and it was really these three pillars uh, that that really they were doing, and we were we were coaching them around, which was food, muscle, and brain. It's a mnemonic I use for medical students, so it's uh, deceptively simple sounding. Uh, but the idea is, if we think about it, it's like a foundation. So this is the little house I built with PowerPoint, and the pillars: food, muscle, and brain. If you do those your foundational cancer supplementation and other things and specific expensive therapies, they hold better, okay? Even if you don't do any specific therapies, all that you do holds better if you have a strong foundation in these three areas. So if we think about it, food is not only what we eat, which certainly is important, but it's adequacy. Am I eating too much or too little? The cleanliness of the food and drink that we have is is it as clean we don't live in a clean world anymore but is it as clean as i can put in me or is it full of chemicals where my body is going to have to fight and fight and fight uh those are two options that you have there also the timing of eating am i eating you know 20 out of 24 hours am i having a bit of a break so i get a little bit of an intermittent fast all of that goes into food muscle is dealing with the idea that muscle is medicine. And, and if you look at all of the data now, and we know more mechanisms about it, but muscle activity sends signals out to the entire body to tell the entire body that we are in the business of healing. So you don't have to be a marathoner, but if you're recovering from cancer and any treatments, if you can get your skeletal muscles moving a little more every week, you'll start to send more and more signals. The counterpoint to muscle as medicine is fat metabolism is disease. And so if the fat metabolism keeps going up, we send signals out that are pro-inflammatory, pro-disease, and pro-cancer. And the only thing to oppose that directly is muscle metabolism. Again, 
people, you know, they'll say, well, geez, I just recovering from chemo. I feel horrible. We start them out with the most basic things. You know, do, can you walk from bed to your kitchen? You know, how many times a day you do that? Three. Okay. Add one more trip. And in a couple of weeks, maybe add two more trips. And pretty soon they're getting the idea. It's just, just about moving. Now, obviously what we eat feeds into fat versus muscle metabolism. So they're intimately connected. And then the brain is, I, I tell patients, a two-way street. We think of the brain often as, okay, you know, what's coming in, which is true. Okay, this is our thoughts, the mind-body connection, et cetera. But we have to be careful if everything is negative that's coming in and we're watching, you know, if we watch any news of the world at any moment, it's never good. And we can talk to friends who are better for our brain and worse for our brain. We have to really, if you're trying to avoid cancer or heal from it or prevent it secondarily to be very careful with what comes in. So we have to put ourselves on a bit of a media diet and watch the things that we allow in. But then, so that's the outside in. The inside out is just as important. And that's what I'm telling myself. And it's very easy when you have chronic illness or cancer to become a very down on things uh, because you don't feel well. You didn't want to have cancer. You're worried about how this is going to play out, how it's going to affect your family and everything. And you're faced with your mortality. You're, of course, there's going to be not the greatest things come up on the inside that you might say to yourself. And this is where having somebody to work with and somebody to talk through these things with on some level uh, can be very, very much a part of the healing as well. And Literally, when I looked backwards and looked at what were the characteristics of the way that patients took care of themselves that were concomitant with them having better quality of life and longer life, these three things came into it. Now, it kind of uh, synchronizes back to the last book I wrote about being an empowered patient. Empowered patients do what they need to do to take care of these areas. Now, certainly we're here to support that, but they ultimately are going to feed themselves. They ultimately are going to decide how much they're doing with their mind. They're ultimately going to be the person that has to motivate themselves to go do things, to move the physical body. And so that's the idea there. And so um, if the foundation is better, I'll also tell them, look, all this money you're putting into these other therapies if the foundation is weak, it's not going to hold. If the foundation is strong. They're more likely to be a good use of your money and your time. And literally what I've seen is people putting tons of money and time into therapies, but they're not taking care of the base. And it literally falls through just like a bad foundation. All right. Well, that gets us uh, up to the Q&A time. And Dr. Wolf is going to read some Q&A. If you're interested here at the end, uh, there's CE on my website. And uh, as was mentioned, the advanced applications in medical practice, we're having a, a neurodiverse patient uh, symposium coming up in about two months in Scottsdale. You can look at that. And uh, we've got great faculty coming for that. But let's, I will do whatever questions. Okay. We have a number that's come in, and uh, please feel free to keep on adding questions as we go through. First question is, what about those who've had sudden onset cancer from vaccine in those aren't at a cellular level for decades? Yeah. Um, what, what I have seen with the, you know, you, we hear about turbo cancers and other things that are happening now. Um, I don't know that there is a different way to deal with it other than they would be like in the early slides. I said there are exceptions to this idea that we only focus, you know, in active diagnosis on maybe the most critical things. Remember, I said the exception would be like I've only got one crack at it, like a advanced pancreatic cancer where I may only have 12 weeks to work with the patient and turn the ship. What I'm seeing with, uh, we'll just call them the era of COVID-induced uh, aggressive cancer, is they are like the worst, most aggressive cancers I've ever seen in my life. And 
if you don't kind of pull out all the stops and do everything you can uh, as quickly as you can, they just progress. And sometimes even with doing everything, they just progress very rapidly. So they they would be more like what used to be an exception, which would be a rapidly progressing stage four aggressive cancer. And uh, the, there's, you know, we can't, uh, at this point, we can't put that genie back in the box. It just, they, the patient has to know that that's a, that is a time where you have to be extremely aggressive and kind of do everything you can at once. Yeah. The next one's why does the vitamin C or what does the vitamin C do differently as an infusion versus oral preparations? Yeah. The biggest thing for infusion is that you can, you do pharmacologically overwhelm the kinetics of the vitamin C that you would take orally. And so if I can put it in you through an infusion, Number one, I can give you orders of magnitude more vitamin C into your plasma, but also by giving that extra amount of vitamin C into your plasma, I can create totally different chemical reactions downstream at the tumor bed or at your normal cells. The biggest ones, although there's about nine different mechanisms by which high-dose vitamin C works, the most famous one is more as a temporary oxidant therapy where it's going to go and it's going to damage the metabolism of cancer cells, but your regular cells have enzymes, so it won't damage your regular cells. You can never take enough orally to do that. Now, are there good reasons to take vitamin C orally in cancer for quality of life and immune support? Definitely. You just can't do with oral what you can do with intravenous. Can you speak to any cases or research that you're familiar with where alternative interventions were the principal treatment uh, and the success or limitations of those types of interventions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and these are, I was, I was talking to a colleague about this just, I don't know when it was recently. And um, we were, of course, not being recorded or in front of anybody, but we just said, well, okay, how many cases do you have where the patient was told you're too old for chemo or this doesn't work or whatever, there, we have no standard of care, go do something else. How many of those people have you seen maintain a durable remission and live a long time? And the small group of us there who had seen that all said, and it's an awfully large number. Um, why do people not publish that sort of thing? Well, there's a lot of reasons why that you might imagine. Um, what I will say is, and this is just my opinion, um, in my personal experience clinically, and that includes, as I said, people I've supervised, et cetera, people for who some reason standard of care was not an option, have been, in many cases, our most successful patients who did integrative therapies. Now, that doesn't mean that I haven't had the same with people who did standard of care and then did integrative stuff, certainly. Uh, but I've had what would otherwise, and, and their oncologists would be totally shocked as well, be quasi-miraculous uh, outcomes with people who are told it's too late for you. We didn't, you know, the chemo is not going to help you or you're too old or you're too young or whatever. And we've had those people live for years and years and years, certainly years and years and years beyond when they were supposed to die. So uh, does this get published a lot? Not, no. Um, there are books written like spontaneous remission and other things like that where they discuss this. Um, you know, I'm hoping to live long enough that maybe if a large enough group of us get together and try and publish something like that, we'll all live through it. Excuse me. A few questions about diet. Uh, one is, uh, can patients use broth during the fasting period? Yeah. Um, it, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've, learned the hard way over time is there, there's there's no absolutes in anything but especially diet 
if a person has a real hard time controlling like their electrolytes, et cetera, um, and, and that's say they're trying to do a 13, 14 hour intermittent fast, then the next step would be either broth or an electrolyte supplement, something like that. Also for people who are just, you know, a lot of people have never in their life not eaten the whole conscious time of the day. Like when they're asleep, it's the only time they're not eating. And so there's a lot of people where it's more of a mental thing. So to get people kind of, you know, doing baby steps into a 13, 14 hour intermittent fast, I'll say, okay, let's start by, you know, stop at dinner. But if you really are freaking out or whatever, you could have some broth in the evening and maybe in the morning before you have your first meal. And then a lot of times they see, oh, you know, I didn't die. It's not going to kill me. I can just hydrate. Um, and, and it's kind of the same with, with the fasts around chemo or just doing fasting. Some people can do that water only. Some people, they do have to do broth and that's still better than eating you know, especially if you're trying to offset the side effects of chemo. Uh, so yeah, you, you know, broth is sort of like, yeah, it's kind of a cheat, but it's probably the least, it's the most innocuous cheat that you could do. <laughs> How about the role of a ketogenic diet in the different phases? Yeah, the, um, it's, so in and we didn't have time but the, the, i keep talking about this triangle we use as a graphic for our patients the top part of the triangle so the apex is you know your uh prescribed diet right now in a lot of people especially if you really don't have very much time what i have seen is ketogenic diet as a prescribed diet being we cleared cleaned everything else up etc is one type of diet that can really get the metabolism sort of under control quickly. So we do prescribe ketogenic approaches and there's different ways to do that, of course, et cetera. Um, and so, yes, it's probably one of the most used therapeutic diets or prescription diets. It can be very useful for folks. Um, what most of the people, and I'm, I know most of these folks in the world who were talking about ketogenic diets proper, you know, five, 10 years ago, what they're really focusing on now is I mentioned briefly metabolic flexibility, which I think is more germane to, because it's very patient specific. So for example, what we used to see with low carbohydrate diets or like a modified Mediterranean diet, that's a low carb. Um, some people would be their insulin control would be really level and flat and great, kind of like you'd see with a keto diet. Other people would be like all over and they would have to do a restrictive keto diet to do that. What that really gets back to is the concept that we're all, imagine this, biologically individual. And so our, our genes that get turned on for blood sugar control, sensitivity to insulin or receptor sensitivity, that whole jumble is what makes in in my mind, it, it's what makes us need either a more restrictive or possibly more liberal type of a diet. But like I say, if you have somebody like I've seen this with, uh, I use the example of aggressive stage four pancreatic cancer, because you just not aren't going to survive that generally. As the dietary intervention, what I have seen work the best is a ketogenic induction rapidly in those sorts of people. Now, later, if they go into remission, maybe we get more broad and we do other stuff. The other end of the spectrum though, with diet is, and we, we again, I'd say we learned it the hard way, but we just sort of had to be realistic was, let's say they're not gonna die, you know, soon. And we've got time. Um, if a person comes in and we show them a keto diet or a, a very restrictive low carb, you know, modified Mediterranean, or we do something else and they look at it and they say, I, you know, they look at the options. They say, well, I, I would never eat that way. My family will not eat that way. And, and it's not worth it to me to make that change. You, you could tell me the best thing in the world about whatever that diet is. I'm not going to do it. Right. Um, there's a large difference between saying, okay, if you can't do that, you can't do anything and saying, well, what can you do? You know, how does your family eat? Are you a vegetarian? Are, you know, what's your background? And you can create a healthy diet for a cancer patient 
by doing the basics like removing processed and packaged foods and removing junk carbohydrates and getting more flavonoids and fibers in their diet and then build on that. And that, that's what, that's what we would do with folks. Um, unless it was really something where they said, I'll do anything. I don't want to do a keto diet, but if, if, if that's my option, that's what I'll do. So I think diet is, you know, the basics are as important as the macros, uh, but whatever you do, the patient's metabolic flexibility has to be under control by the diet or the diet's not helping as much as it could. Uh, how do you increase mitochondrial function without stimulating cancer cells? To give some uh, suggestions here, like NADH, resveratrol, glandulars, immunoglobulins, are they safe? What do you suggest? Yeah, that's a, that's a, I'll do a really short answer to a long answer. Uh, so there's a couple of things. One is if you look at what we do during therapy, like cancer therapy, more from the integrative side, um, we will often do mitochondrial priming supplement slash drugs because we know that they are going to speed up the normal mitochondria and they are also going to speed up the cancer mitochondria, which is dysfunctional. And when you do that, the cancer cell becomes weaker. Now, as a concept that works, if you manage it appropriately in healing the patient afterwards, you have the same thing going for you. Let's say there's some leftover cancer cells. If you mitochondrially prime them and try and help them recover, the normal cells are going to go off the normal complex one through five imprint of the mitochondria. And the more you make that work, the better they'll be. The cancer cells will still be put into it, make cancer cell mitochondria go faster and they're weaker. Okay. So let's say you don't think there's any cancer around, there's some leftover cells. That's generally fine. There's a couple of times where you have to be very careful. One, which was mentioned in one of the questions, is uh, NAD. So while I use a lot of NAD therapies with people for many things, if you do constant NAD therapy with people, it doesn't have that checkpoint between cancer cell stimulation and normal cell stimulation, uh, like say alpha lipoic acid or, or curcumin or resveratrol would have. With NAD, you have somewhere on the order of a 50-50 chance of metabolizing one way or the other, and one way is very pro-cancer. So with NAD and people in recovery after cancer or NAD primers like nicotinamide riboside or NMN, I might use them for a very brief time, but I don't ever use them consistently with people who have a history of cancer or or even in the recovery from cancer because NAD is not like all those other things that that are are mitochondrially priming. Methylene blue, on the other hand, is um, it does not have the same metabolism as NAD, and it's actually being researched fairly aggressively in oncology, not so much for recovery of people, but but for um, recovery of primary organs like kidney damage due to chemotherapy and stuff like that. And what they're noticing in the research, like just from last year, is that methylene blue actually can go in and epigenetically turn off uh, the um, the DNA damage cycle that kills your, can your kidney cells. Uh, and what they're finding, which I think the more they do it, the more we'll see these trends, is it, do it doesn't have the cancer turned back on like NAD might. So I, I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of upside hope for methylene blue in the recovery phase for people too. But yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. But you do have to go back to the idea that most cancer cell mitochondria are extremely dysfunctional, and anything that upregulates them makes them extremely fragile. The reason NAD is different is that it, it's 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 got a metabolic component that might help the cancer. So you have to just be careful. 
what do you recommend for patients with immunotherapy? This patient's ads for melanoma, but probably immunotherapy in general. Yeah, immunotherapy is, uh, you know, it's like multi, multi billions of dollars every year we're spending on those. So they're, you know, I mean, it's it's about time with some of our chemos we use are 75 years old at this point or 100 years old. Um, immunotherapies generally, and you, you know, there's lots of different categories of immunotherapies. But if if I was to summarize about six hours worth of class material about natural therapies and immunotherapies, they generally are very synergistic with some of our core integrative therapies. Uh, the use of melatonin, almost always synergistic. Curcumin, everything I've ever read where they've studied them together with most immunotherapies, very good. Uh, and, and what I would say is that that would be true of most botanicals that you might use there. So I do a lot of, uh, and certainly like vitamin C orally or IV is no problem with immunotherapies. Um, but I, but like chronically, I do, I do a lot of botanical medicine with uh, someone on immunotherapies. And, and generally, they're very, very tolerant, probably much more tolerant than a standard uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy. What are your thoughts about repurposed drugs like ivermectin, mebendazole, metformin, and others? Yeah. Well, that's only four hours worth of material. I'll just shorten it right up. Uh, th I, I use them all the time, uh, the number one. And we've we've actually, like, I know they're real hot and sexy right now, but I've been using repurposed drugs for over 20 years. So they're not new. What we know about them is newer. That's good. I think one of the things, if I could just say one thing that I really want people to understand, because it's the most common misconception people will come to the conferences and tell me, is a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are anti-parasitic drugs. And so you you kind of have an idea that maybe the reason they work in cancer is that there's a parasite cancer connection, which there is, but that's not why these things work. Now, certainly if the person, I always warn people, I put them on, you know, uh, maybe, you know, mebendazole or albendazole and ivermectin and maybe one other and we rotate them. I will say, look, most of us have parasites we don't know about. If you get digestive upset from this or some diarrhea, et cetera, that's just the parasites dying and let me know and we'll work with that. that that's fine. That's not cancer. The reason these drugs work so well though, is beyond what they do to parasites. They are their master immunomodulators. And so if you look at the avermectin family, which ivermectin comes from, or uh, the um, benzimidazole family, which, you know, albenza and mebenzole, those guys come from, yes, they kill bugs but they also are immunomodulatory. Very similar to the way that vitamin D works, very similar to the way that low-dose naltrexone works, uh, similar to the way that certain cannabinoids work. They just do it in very specific like imprints of, uh, of immunomodulation, which is why I usually will use multiple of them and rotate them because you know one alone is usually not enough. And if you look at uh, the work that the places that are, you know, a little more famous doing uh, repurposed drugs, it's almost always a cocktail or a rotation that goes on. Um, one where it's a little bit different would be like metformin. The The pharmacology of why that's doing what it does is, is a little bit different, but most of the other repurposed drugs are immunomodulators. And if you think about it, you're trying to help cancer and you're trying to help this delicate immune system that's probably been beat up by everything else, what you're trying to do is not to up or down regulate your immunity. You're trying to get it back into a harmonic balance. That's why curcumin can work so well, because it's it's not an up or down. It's up or down on 100 different levels, and it's so it becomes balancing. Low-dose naltrexone, similar, vitamin D, similar. So uh, repurposed drugs can be really helpful I think they should be used way more than they are, um, but it's it's their immunomodulatory effect. And 
and you get the benefit of all your parasites will die anyway, uh, right away. So, yeah. <laughs> we still have a number of questions. I just want to gauge your comfort level and how long you want to keep on going. I still here. have water and my voice is holding out. Let's, let's do what we can. Oh, yeah. It's only 8.15. We have time anyway. Sure. <laughs> uh, do uh, PET CT scans required for follow-up activate cancer cells? Um, to the degree that I know of everything I can read about them, I think on balance, no, you know, there's, there's a chance with the scout, uh, the scout CT, you know, has some radiation and there's always, you know, some issue there, but the dose probably isn't nearly the, like the, the danger as, as a regular, regular follow-up CTs are. Um, obviously any imaging procedure, you don't want to get any more than you have to, but my personal experience has been people who are followed with PET CT are far less troubled by that than people who are followed with standard CT or other, you know, other things. What are your thoughts about inhaled hydrogen? It's something, um, I have a well, a lot. I have some colleagues who are doing that. Um, I'm very interested in you know, like Brown's gas and other stuff like that. I just don't have enough direct experience or or even like monitoring what other people are doing to have a feeling one way or the other. It makes sense chemically, um, but I just don't like, I haven't seen it enough to see. And that's probably really great. How about alternatives to IV vitamin C where access is, access is restricted or uh, people are unable to use it? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things, well, with, with all integrative cancer therapies, you know, everything costs money. Um, and any anything you do IV has got the cost of doing the IV, which is now horrendous because of many reasons. Um, and we would have commonly people who would say i'd really be interested in doing IV vitamin c but i just i can't afford it i have no you know financial resources to do it and what i would say is it it's you know the higher intervention things like say iv therapy or maybe like hyperbaric oxygen or photodynamic stuff or whatever you know where there's technology involved there's always more cost so yes you could say if money's no object, which it's always an object, but if money was no object, you would always do all of this. It would probably shorten up the, you know, getting your body like under control by, you know, 30, 40%, maybe 50%. But that's not to say that if, if that's just not an option, you, you don't have access, you can't afford it, or, or there's nobody doing it. There are plenty of things that you can do. So for example, if we have that as you know, the reason, and the reason might not be money. It might be, they live too far away, you know, or, or some other thing. Then what I will explain is, is that the benefit of these interventional therapies is that they work sort of regardless of what your body is doing at the moment. What that means is if those aren't on the menu, we can't do them. Then we have to figure out a way where you can, whatever we decide your dietary intervention needs to be, we got to be really on top of that and like make whatever changes we have to make there. So the diet becomes, you know, it's always a big deal, but it's like, that's got to get online really quickly. Um, if you know, all of the other things, uh, things I call hygienic, just the things that keep us alive. If you are not sleeping, you're not getting enough rest. We have to work on that very assiduously. So it's like, everything's important, but all these things that you have more control over that cost less or nothing, are, you know, they're 10 times more critical that we get them done now, you know. Uh, and then you can look at, there's, um, I've had people where, you know, the finances were the biggest thing. And although maybe not the most, uh, you know, well-absorbed or whatever, I've said, well, can you go to your, the organic aisle or your co-op or wherever and can you buy as big of a piece of uh, turmeric root and uh, peel off the outside and, and grind it into your food every time you eat 
uh, can in, and we would we, go through things that they could literally, yes, it costs a little bit more, but it's not as much as a bottle of real high speed curcumin. Uh, and we found as many things as we could get into their diet as additives, you know, um, and and then teas and other stuff that they could do. So, yeah, there's some costs, but way less. And often they would say, well, don't I need, you know, the like this curcumin that absorbs really fast and it's got all the stuff. It's like, yeah, if you can afford that, it's probably going to work faster. But also people don't realize this. A large portion of the curcumin research in, I mean, there's, what is there? Like 300,000 hits on PubMed for curcumin. So a large portion of the research is actually done with plain turmeric. It's not done with the super absorbable stuff. Yes, are there differences with the expense? Yeah, sure, yeah. So I'll just tell them, look, like a large body of the very beneficial outcome research was done with what you could grind into your food or, you know, into a smoothie or something like that. So, you know, you, you do, you have to think a little broader. Um, also, something people don't realize because like for whatever reason in the mushroom world, We've marginalized white button mushrooms. I have no idea. They're, it's like they're the uh, iceberg lettuce of mushrooms. Um, but there's now research that shows in like in breast cancer, I think it is. Um, I have a friend who's expert in this. I just rely on them. But um, there's research that shows that just eating, you know, a kind of a regular serving of white button mushrooms increases um, the uh, immune markers and immune modulations the same as taking mushroom supplements and stuff. So there's all sorts of stuff. Anything you can get in the person's diet makes it easier. They, they, you know, they may have to change their tastes. They may not like certain things, but like those things can, those can be really quite potent. Um, and then you just kind of have to focus on what can we do with the way you eat, what you eat, fasting, et cetera. Um, what can we do to get the muscle as medicine thing going, regardless of how weak you are? And then uh, we really need to get on, you know, what are you hearing from the outside and what are you telling yourself from the inside of the brain? So, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, the the lack of ability to get interventional things doesn't mean you can't do anything. It's, you know, yes, would it be maybe better? Sure, but doesn't mean you can't do so. Sticking on that vitamin C antioxidant line, uh, how about therapies like vitamin C or glutathione during active cancer treatment? Would they be useful or are they nourishing tumor cells or tumor microenvironment? Yeah. Well, so it's kind of two, um, with vitamin C and glutathione, there's kind of two answers. Um, vitamin C itself is not such a big deal uh, because it's water soluble and your body doesn't store much at all. You store a tiny bit in your adrenals and not much. So what goes in goes out every day. And you're under stress when you're in chemo, radiation, a little bit's not going to be a problem. In that big review I did, you know, they looked at even rate, you know, radiation oncologists won't want you even to look at vitamin C containing foods during radiation. But they've looked at like supplementing oral vitamin C. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, so vitamin C is not such a big deal during chemo and radiation. Uh, in fact, probably synergy. Glutathione um, is one of those things where it's not all good or all bad, but it's a little bit like NAD, where I was saying you can reach a tipping point where the metabolism is pro-cancer, and we don't want to do that. Now, do we deplete glutathione with chemo and radiation severely? Yeah. During the initial trying to kill the daughter cells of the tumor, is that a good thing? Yeah, right. Like high dose vitamin C depletes your glutathione to a degree. So during active therapy, if someone were to take some glutathione periodically, like once a week, that's not going to be a problem for anything. Now that we have absorbable like acetyl glutathione or liposomal glutathione, if you take that every day, you will start to raise your glutathione levels to the point where it may actually either interfered directly with chemotherapy or cause the glutathione sensitive cancer cells to have a benefit. So what I always tell people is if we need it for a therapeutic reason, we'll do it in punctuated doses and give you a break. Um, the other side of the coin is 
cancer cells that use glutathione to be resistant to chemo, especially, they make all the glutathione inside of their cells. They have enzymes to do that. That's why they're resistant. Now, is there data that shows that if I add glutathione into that person, it enhances it? Yeah, this is why we don't do it every day. Now, what about not, let's say you're past that. And we actually had some of the research that didn't get written up, but I talk about is uh, radiation damage from therapeutic radiation. And we specifically did punctuated high-dose glutathione as intravenous. Uh, so we get cofactors intravenously and then glutathione two days a week for eight weeks. And then uh, one day a week for four to eight weeks. And that would help people with the radiation burns from head and neck, you know, radiation that they would get and help their nerves recover. That's for a therapeutic purpose. It's punctuated in a period of time and it's not every day forever. Yeah. People in, you know, long-term maintenance, again, just, you know, do it a couple of days a week and then give yourself a break the rest of the week and you should be fine. We're coming up on 8.30 here, so I'm going to maybe give you two more, and then uh, Peter will give some closing thoughts here. Okay. Um, are there any specific biomarkers that you evaluate to assess the terrain? And additionally, thoughts on circulating tumor cells, liquid biopsy, uh, tests like gallery. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll go in reverse order. So uh, CTCs, so circulating tumor cells, um, that whole world has come a very long way in the last 15 years. So for example, 15 years ago, we were using one of the big platforms, not for diagnostic purposes, but just to follow and say, if we do circulating tumor cells on this person, you know, every three months, does it follow their disease or not? And 15 years ago, it was as common, it was completely irrelevant information as it was relevant. Nowadays, the technology, you might even see the same platform name, but the technology is totally different. Nowadays, I think the sensitivity is much higher and you get better, you do get better, um, you get better data from it. Um, it's still at a point where I think in 10 years, it'll be a lot better. I think right now it's it's good. It's in its infancy of being good. There's also things like circulating tumor DNA, like little c, little t DNA. That's quite useful for a lot of uh, a lot of people to follow if, if if you have the marker that they're looking for. I, I like that one. Um, and and basically, if the test is like you look at a particular platform and they say we you know we have good statistics for these four cancers, you know. I would use it. I would follow it. And again, you look at, does, does it match my patient outcomes or not? Right. Because I've seen people like in the early days, huge circulating tumor cell numbers, and they lived a very long time. I've seen people with zero circulating tumor cells and they were dead in a month. So, you know, that was old school. As I say, we're in the infancy of that technology being useful. And so I think there's that. I have seen... Uh, I'm not supposed to say the name. It's a, you can guess, it's a large university on the East Coast that everyone knows about. I was in their pathology lab and they showed me uh, this device that uses nanotechnology and it runs the cancer patient's blood through a little, I grew up on a cattle ranch, so it looked like a corral to me. And it uses nano gates to let one cell through at a time. And then it reads the cell and if the cell has certain markers, it shuffles it into one little corral. And if it's totally normal, it goes to another corral. And then if it has other markers, it goes over to another corral. And the guy said, this is the only one of these that's in the United States right now. He says, this will make most of radiology obsolete, we hope in you know, a few years. Now, what I will say is that was right before COVID. They've been busy with other things since then. So I have no idea where the technology is, but I think that kind of technology is really what we need uh, because it would be predictive before you knew you had cancer, but it would also be predictive for recurrence way before any imaging would show you. 
and I think probably like a hundred times more sensitive than what we have now with CTC. So I, I think they're good. You just have to recognize that they're going to be clunkers sometimes for tests. Oh, and yeah, markers. Sorry, yeah. yeah um, so basic, I mean, there's tons of markers we can do now. Um, I, I always start with, with basic, certainly if there's a, uh, a tumor marker, a standard one, you know, like CA or something, yeah, we'll use that. Uh, but I, I like to look at, um, metabolic markers across the board that are associated with worse or better outcomes in cancer. So those would be mundane things like alkaline phosphatase, GGT, LDH. Those are big ones. Also, uh, fibrinogen and ferritin, D-dimer. All of that should make you a little concerned in the age of COVID where those go up in people for you know, for cytokine reasons due to COVID or vaccines or whatever, and then they don't go down. Same reason they go up in cancer, not always with cancer, but those are important. Uh, something that my colleague Jeannie Drisco at uh, KU Med, when they were doing, we were doing our vitamin C research at the same time, they noticed and hit me to the idea that they just followed uh, serum iodine, very simple, cheap, and, it, and it, this doesn't mean iodine causes cancer, but if you see serum iodine trend up in a cancer patient, they're going to have a recurrence. So we would follow that because, again, it's just cheap. It's sort of like LDH and fibrinogen and D-dimer. So I would do sort of a suite of those things. Um, definitely things like fasting insulin and C-peptide, looking at their metabolic flexibility and how their insulin sensitivity is very, very important. And then from there, you can get really more elaborate. You can follow VEGF now and you can follow um, T TGF betas. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't used to be able to check that you can check now. A lot of those tests take go from mundane pricing to really high pricing. So you might want to check on that before you get into those. I'm going to lobby an easy one for the very last one. Do you consult with cancer patients out of state? Ah, uh, uh, if if I had seventy two hours in every day, I would. Um, I I have patients currently. I just will let you know that, and I do consult with a lot of clinicians, but I've had to kind of cap that right now because I I've just run out of time. Jacob, thank you for facilitating thank you, this Jake. piece. And um, I actually want to slip in one real quick bonus question. Yeah. It's like one of the few perks of being a co-leader of the chapter, I could do that. It's very quick. Uh, it was really just a terminology thing, but I, I believe you said earlier uh, that you were trying to make um, the stem cells kind of calm and happy. And, and you know that was the best way of trying to assure that they didn't like rear their ugly heads up again. It's just, you know, I've heard other IO practitioners use kind of like the opposite kind of language is like, let's make the tumor micro environment, the micro environment as hostile as possible for the development of cancer. Are you actually saying the same thing, but just coming from a different angle or are you talking about two different things? Mm, that's a good I mean, question. Wait, yeah, I th I think you know we I think we we all uh, anthropomorphize the uh, the tumor cells, and so we try and use um, words that make them sound human. I guess um, the reason that I m gravitated to using terms like actually the the opposed to hostile they may actually mean the same thing. Uh, but the way that I look at it, if you look at the tumor biology of why would a tumor stem cell turn on and get the, the stroma, the microenvironment in a, in a chemistry that's pro-cancer and then starts recruiting other cells. So like, if you look at that as like, I don't want that to happen if I've had cancer, mm -hmm. right? Um, the happy part of it really is more looking from the normal human cells in and saying, which is true, the more the normal human cells are are without impediments to normal cell function and homeostasis and all that. So 
as little toxic material, as good a hormonal signaling as, you know, good nutrition, low epigenetic stuff. Uh, the better all that is, the more they force the chemistry of the stroma not to like flip over into a pro-cancer sort of a chemistry. Now, the converse, if you want me to look at like hostility, would be definitely during the active treatment phases, almost everything that we do is more on the hostile side, okay? Um, and and so if you look at whether you're doing, say, ozone or high-dose vitamin C or, you know, high doses of botanicals of certain types or whatever, yes, you're beating up on the daughter cells, but you're also making things very hostile for cancer stem cells to do anything, mm -hmm. right? Whereas traditional chemo just sort of indiscriminately hurts everything in the neighborhood. Oh, and the cancer stem cells are so smart, they will just sort of fold up and go uh, and hide and, and, and go away. So you have, you have sort of, you know, traditional chemo is universal hostility. Um, most of the natural sort of hostile things, the way I would look at them, have a have this differential benefit where they're going to hurt anything that's got cancer metabolism. They're not really going to hurt your normal cells, and normal cells might be stronger because of it. So certainly during active treatment, it's much more of a hostile sort of a thing. But if you're in remission and long term looking at it more from the outside in of all my normal cells, I want them to be as healthy as possible. That's actually one of the biggest oppositions to a tumor stem cell and the stroma from converting back over. You know, you, you could think of like a extreme example, person gets a huge toxic exposure, you know, coupled with a raging infection coupled with, you know, only inflammatory hormones that's making all the normal tissue very dysfunctional. And that's the time where the cancer stem cells are going to say, this is our time and they're going to you know, come back out. Yeah. So there's nothing happy going on during that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you're saying by making our normal cells happy, we mm. are creating a hostile environment for the yeah. tumor. Yeah. We, I, I guess, you know, and I probably take the anthropomorphism a little too far, but I, I I take it to the next step of of the cancer stem cells. It's like a Jedi mind trick. They they're <laughs> believing that everything is not uh, favorable to them living, and so they're going to happily stay quiet and just you know go over to the side. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we will have to follow this up on another occasion. But yes, <laughs> Dr. Anderson, <laughs> there's so much to pursue. But thank you so, so, so very much for uh, taking the time to uh, speak for us and speak to us and uh, share your expertise and um, your wisdom and insights. This has been really fantastic. Uh, there was a question in the chat about CEs, um, not, not for this talk. Um, we don't do CEs for our chapter events. Um, Dr. Anderson was talking about CEs available on his on his site on his website and about the recording um, and um, Dr. Wolf put this into the chat too but yes there is going to be a recording and it will be available on the AIHM YouTube channel um, I am going to send a, a little note to everybody who's registered um, just letting you guys know when that when that will be available uh, it's not going to be too long. And um, other than that, um, please sign. If you thought this was a great talk, and it was a great talk, we do lots of really good events. So please sign up our on uh, our membership list, and then you'll be apprised of everything else that's, that's going on. So um, that's about all I have to say, except thank you again. Um, and thank you all for coming. And um, we'll, we'll see you the next time around. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.